when when you look back at, at what's happened individually to all of you, everything physically that you you've had to overcome this has obviously been the most difficult of recordings but the fact that you've risen above whatever was put in front of you does this make this album the most satisfying that you've ever done well i wouldn't say ever but i mean it's very satisfying after so many years because of, yeah because of all the crazy tragedies between john and chris and me but um all of us you know i, I never thought in a million years all three of us would be, would be injured so severely you know over a couple of year time uh but i'm just satisfied mostly because i'm really happy with the songs you know and, it, yeah, and yeah. i guess covid terrible a million people died of covid more but the fact i guess it it gave us the time to really take our time and write 25 songs and narrow it down to 14 that I really, really loved as a producer. And then the record company took four off, which I hope they'll come out, you know, yeah, in the yeah. summer or something. And I understood why, because, you know, it's coming out on vinyl. So, you know, if you only have 10 on vinyl, you have... 14 or 15 on a CD, people are going to go for the CD, get more yeah, tracks, yeah. I get it. I'd be in competition with myself. But, uh, <laughs> but I want to touch on your plan. your situation. You know, the this, this botched spinal surgery, which led to the paralysis and ending up with you literally not being able to play guitar or write on piano. Now, how does somebody yeah. who has spent a lifetime doing this cope and acclimatize to what in effect is a new existence it's been difficult mm. i almost wish they would have paralyzed my left hand because being right-handed i really hoped in the last three years that um i would acclimate you know to using my left hand but i haven't my brain just doesn't function that way i mean it, Beyond playing bass, piano, guitar, it just makes everyday chores, you know, making the bed, washing dishes, pulling weeds. Uh, I can't use my chainsaw anymore. I have a very large estate. I have to keep up on. So it's affected everything. Getting dressed, you know, I mean, uh, <laughs> I was talking to somebody, my son, I said, try putting your pants on some afternoon <laughs> with just one hand. And try buttoning your shirt with just one hand and not your dominant. And he did. And he goes, I couldn't do it. <laughs> it was impossible. You know, so that all of that stuff's been really, uh, God, it's been a couple of years, but I just, it's been hard. You, know? you talked about uh, three stages when yep. you got paralyzed. You, you said, first of all, there's this, you know, there's this um, depression. Um, yep. And then, you go through a whole load of emotions and end with revenge. So after navigating the first two, the revenge is presumably aimed at the paralysis to show it that you can still do it. You can still function. You can still do what you want to do. You can write. You can do music. So this is you against the paralysis. It's me against it. Um, you know, yeah, it's like a big, uh, what's the word? Uh, it's a goal. But I don't think I'll, you know, reach it. Uh, it's been three years and it's actually gotten worse. But I'd like revenge against the surgeon because I don't want him to kill people or paralyze anybody else. You know, obviously uh, he's incompetent. You know, this was a very uh, normal thing that should have been done. My road manager had the same one done, C4 and C5 in the neck. So he obviously botched it. And, uh, you know, I think he should be held accountable. Mm -hmm. I, I do. I, I don't want him to do this to other people. And I've done in the last couple of years a lot of reading and research on other doctors. And one of them is doing life in prison right now for killing a couple of people because he was incompetent. And he was a spine surgeon. He actually operated on his best friend and paralyzed him. 
from like the neck down. So uh, it's a learning curve that you assume that when they're a doctor that they should know what they're doing. But that's not really the case. Did he ever have any conversation with you, by the way, afterwards to to just say, like, you know, I I didn't even apologize. No, that's why I'm suing, you know, and uh, we'll probably go to court like February. It's taken that long because of COVID shut everything down as far as courts and, you know, my guitarist, John Levin, he's an attorney. He said, man, you can't even get into court for six months because everything was backed up and everybody's trying to catch up. But he, uh, yeah, when I t- showed him my hand, and God, it was even better then. And when he, when he just said, sorry, that just, I wanted to punch him. And I think I told you a story about what I said to him about Yo-Yo Ma. And that was really insulting to me. Uh, you know, because the doctor's Chinese. So I used Yo-Yo Ma as an example, and I said, what do you think would have happened if you did this to Yo-Yo Ma's right hand? He couldn't bow his cello anymore, probably the most famous cellos in the world. And he said, you're not Yo-Yo Ma. So I thought, wow. So that, to me, I took that as you're not important, you know? You're yeah, just, yeah. You're just, yeah. Some rock, you're just some rock guy, you know? Uh, when he says, you're not Yo-Yo Ma, I'm like, I don't care if you're a radio personality, uh, you know, a gardener. Uh, when you ruin someone's life, uh, you should be held accountable. Absolutely. It's yeah. like a car accident. If you kill somebody in a car accident and you kill them, uh, like some rock stars have, you know, they, they should spend more than three days in jail. You know, so that's not the way it works, apparently. On to a happier um, uh, there's there's a growing anticipation uh, for this this album because yeah. uh, people are seeing what you've had to deal with and how you've overcome it, all of you. And there's a feeling that, that everybody wants this to, to succeed for you. Everybody wants this to be a big success. I think so. I, you know, I mean, I was pretty shocked. When I, you know, you know, the world's changed. You know, people have shorter attention spans. You go on YouTube, look at a video. People just click on it, maybe watch a minute of it, and then they move on to the next video, you know. So when we got, it's, I think it's way over a half a million uh, hits on Fugitive right now on YouTube. I was blown away. You know, that is a lot of hits in a month. You know? Yeah, yeah. Gypsy came out, the animated thing we did. And I haven't even checked that. I don't look at that, at, you know, but I, somebody told me it's pushing a hundred thousand. It's only been out like three weeks. So apparently there's a lot of people wanting this to succeed and they're liking the songs. So You've been on this uh, voyage of discovery I and mean, you're going through all these old hard drives, extracting all this you know, treasure. You know, a few years ago, you did it when you cleared out the garage and you found the the Hamburg and the California tapes. So, what yeah. did you what did you over, uh, unearth rather in in all of these old hard drives that you were looking through? No, nope. there's nothing. Li- no, I didn't use anything for this record. This was all written by scratch, and and when I put out the the lost tapes, that's it. They've submitted. Yeah, yeah. What's what do you have left in your catalog? And I say nothing, you know, I mean, uh, luckily I written and John, you know, John wrote the music for a lot of this record and so did I, but that was all done, done before I got paralyzed. So Mm. we were lucky, you know, I guess maybe the stars aligned or something because John had a run too. You know, what what I call a rush or a run, you know, you get inspired by whatever the universe yeah, sends yeah. you. And I, and I know, and I try to explain that to non-musicians, and they don't understand. They just sit, you know, a band gets together and they just write. But that's what the frustrating part is when, you know, you're on a time crunch, you got eight weeks to make a record, and I'd go in, you know, be at my house trying to write, and I got nothing. 
it just doesn't come. You know, I can't force it. And then when I do force it, I'm thinking, oh, that's a pretty good song. And then the next day I go, no, it's not. <laughs> you know, it depends your mindset, you know. You got you. You said that there were these fifteen, twenty songs, and you you put them over to the record company. Three of them were you playing guitar, weren't they? Your, yeah, you described you it that. as your last hurrah. I'm bummed about that. Yeah, those were the ones that I found. Uh, I think those yeah those songs were written before I moved out of California because I could. Uh, those were written. See, I moved to New Mexico four years ago. I had the Beverly Hills house five, six. Yeah, there it was before obviously surgery. So yeah, it was leftover material and I didn't really want to uh, revisit that. I just figured, you know, I don't want to just grab something and put on this record. And then I was surprised how much leftover material I had from uh, Broken Bones of 10 years ago. Yeah. But, um, you know, there are pieces uh, they weren't completed. Uh, so, some had choruses, some had me singing. I call them seeds, I guess, you know, they were like trees that were in the process of growing. So that was exciting. Yeah, that, yeah, I was bummed <laughs> that it just happens to be that the songs they took off the record are the ones me playing guitar. So I'll but at some point. There is a chance, of course, because the record companies like to deliver deluxe and expanded editions that those are going to appear here at some time in the future. I think so. They'll probably wait till this record's run its course and they'll put out the, you know, bonus edition. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm already, so did you to, uh, to, uh, I'm working on for next year. I've already started writing the lyrics for Christmas songs. They want to do a Christmas album. I've done one before for, uh, D Snyder. Uh, for charity, they did that rock and roll kind of a Christmas. Uh, yeah, yeah. I did Santa Claus is Coming to Town, like a heavy metal style, rock and such style. But I'm now writing, instead of doing like, you know, Santa Claus is Coming to Town and Jingle Bells and all that, I'm actually writing lyrics about Christmas and reindeer and Santa, like writing my own st stories. And we're just going to rock them out. So did you film any of this recording process? Because, again, these days, all type of, of content is, is devoured by fans and everybody who like to watch recording process, interviews while yeah. you're in there. So did you do any of this for future no. release? Yeah. You know, that's a good point. I mean, I think we were just talking the other day uh, – so I was on the road and the record company asked me if I would take, I got a new camera, I mean a new phone. And the new phone's got this amazing camera on it, you know. Is this a new so iPhone? I bought a selfie kit. Yeah, the new i14. Now they're yeah. offering an i15 for free if you have an old iPhone, which I do. But, you know, I've always not cared about cell phones. I just had a really old you know, junky iPhone that worked fine and had one little camera. But now when I turned it on, I went, holy mackerel. I mean, it's like really good quality. So I just walk around and, you know, and film the boys backstage and sound checking. And I just went out yesterday and filmed myself uh, hiking with my dogs. <laughs> and that's what they want, <laughs> contact. And they're always curious about, you know, me living, buying a, buying a mountain with no neighbors way 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 secluded you know um so i said yeah i'll take the camera out there and grab the old selfie stick and and it actually turned out to be kind of funny because you know you live on this mountain i have like you know 25 acres millions of rocks everywhere but one of my dogs is a has discerning taste <laughs> for rocks <laughs> and, I'm, and she'll find she'll just keep running around running around all these rocks but nope, it has to be a certain rock. And once she finds it, she'll go after it and start digging it up and chasing it down the hill. And she's got to have that rock. And I, I just think it's the strangest thing. And then she brings it back to the house. I get up in the morning and there's, there's a rock, you know, <laughs> sitting in the kitchen. And I'm like, <laughs> man, that's a huge rock. I don't know how she got it in her mouth. 
<laughs> but that's it's a very strange fetish she has, you know. She, I mean, why don't she just walk out 10 feet and grab it? Nope, nope. She's got to run all over the property and find the rock. <laughs> and then so, and I guess it's a challenge, right? It's like yeah, chasing yeah. women, you know. You know, when you got <laughs> women you know, at a concert and you're like, I know, but I want that woman. And she's <laughs> kind of the same way. And she's a little girl. She's a little small shepherd. But so I filmed it. It's going to be uploaded at some point, probably in the next couple of weeks. But it looks funny because it's, it's like a boulder in her mouth. Her jaw is wide open. I mean, she just crammed it in there. And I thought, well, it just was hilarious to me. So maybe people find that funny. Uh, but I'm going to start. I That's one of my big regrets about our past making tooth and nail under lock and key back of the attack. We didn't film our sessions. We didn't film rehearsals. We didn't film any of it, you know? So that was a big, and looking back that I've mm -hmm. made ahead of a career. It would have been nice to have that as a uh, memories, you know? Yeah. I have pictures, yeah, yeah, sure. tons of them. I found that too. When I found the lost tapes, I, I found two big plastic bins of thousands of pictures, uh, my baby pictures, my parents' wedding picture, uh, band shots. Uh, back in the day, when you had to go, remember, you had to go down and drop off the film and get it developed. Brilliant, yeah. <laughs> so tell me, just heading back to that um, to this this album, Bill Palmer, uh, Bridges and Kevin Shirley Engineering. First time you've worked with yeah. Kevin Shirley. But what's interesting here is that what he delivered you the first time was absolutely what you didn't want, which was uh, an 80s rehash. So you told him to literally just go and produce you something modern. And you referenced that latest album by uh, Iron Maiden, Senjutsu, which isn't a rehash. So you sent him away yeah. to come back with something modern. Yeah, I, I, you know, we just had miscommunication, I guess. So then we had to get on the same page. And I just basically said, you know, treat it as the Iron Maiden album. He had just finished when he started with my album. And I said, treat it like the Iron Maiden album. You know, that, that's why I was so happy because that new Iron Maiden album he did uh, is sounds amazing. Punchy, loud, aggressive. You know, I just yeah, really yeah. liked it. But he just, he never worked with me and, and, uh, but, you know, it was great that he said, I've always wanted to mix a docking record. So, or record, you know, so that was great. You know, a lot of engineers now, they just want to, you know, push the buttons for me and get their money and go on. That's yeah, why yeah. I got lucky with Bill Palmer because Bill, which is interesting because Bill's not a rock guy. He's not a rock guy. He's Mark. He's a musician too. And, he uh he's more like country and stuff like that, folk kind of music. So doing the docking record was a whole new experience for him. So that you was worked. Kind of I was gonna say you worked yourself long and hard on these uh, vocals and said that you actually did these three times before you, you got it right. Don't know who it was that said it. But I remember that great quote, which was, perfection is unattainable, but if you chase it and put the work in, then you'll catch excellence. Yeah, you have to chase it. And I was making some mistakes on the Heaven Comes Down record where I was trying to sing like the fans expect me to. You know, hitting all those really high notes and, you know, just you know, what they no know, know me for. But I just have to face reality that, you know, um, my my voice is not what it used to be. You know, it's I can't sing it. Some singers yeah, yeah. can. I mean, Ronnie James Dio, the last album he did, he was already going through cancer treatment, and he, they recorded that live album at Radio City Music Hall in New York. And he sounded just like he did four years ago. So some people are blessed, you know, but I... Uh, I just a lot of wear and tear in my vocal cords. Yeah, so yeah. I had, nice I had, said. 
it's wear and tear. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you, you've you know, said I, I, that I, this... I mean, I, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, you said that this has got the, the classic dock and sound. In other words, these are right. great songs that be blasting out of your car when you're driving down the highway. Absolutely. But, you know, I'm, I'm just singing. I had to find my comfort spot, you know. Like, yeah. I have nothing to prove anymore after all the records I've done. This would be number 13. So, you know, a lot of these bands, they, you know, they put a record out every year. But, like I said, I had a lot of problems and then the voice. And, you know, I had surgery on my voice 30 years ago. Had some polyps, just like Klaus did. But I have, a, I know where I can sing nice without being too husky. And uh, I just had to realize, as Bill said to me, he goes, just... As long as you emote your sentiment in these songs, you don't have to sing it way up at the top of your range. What's the point? You're just straining yourself and you're, and you're raspy. And, and I said, yeah, you're right. You know, so he was right. So I just found my sweet spot. And that had a lot to do with the songs. I wrote them in keys that weren't off the scale, you know. Mm -hmm comfortable keys you know uh, a and e the low lower registers so so tell me the the artwork on the front the artwork looks great it's really v visually striking pretty cool and huh? i was thinking when you you look at all the albums that have been done over the last 20 25 years th th this fits in as probably the best of the last quarter of a century i thought i think I, I agree you know and of all the things it was chris mccarville our bass player he drew it he happens to be an artist wow yeah chris did it and uh first record company hired somebody else and we waited for a long time this guy just couldn't get it together and he felt pressured because yeah. we saw all the docking covers in the past and when i explained to him that was a high school cool friend I went to school with, Dave the Nave Williams, and I, and I told him that he drew him by hand, and he, he was uh, uh, awestruck of all the colors and the blending and that phoenix, and he goes, he assumed it was just all photoshopped and illustrated. I said, nope, he refuses. His whole life, Dave would just, he, I got to do it by hand with pencils. But you were talking about months, it would take him months all that blending, but that's just the way he worked. Unfortunately, he passed away. So, uh, last couple of years. So here, uh, the guy who worked on the album cover was trying to, you know, uh, copy him. And I said, well, that's like somebody trying to copy my music style. So yeah. Chris really nailed it. But on this album, you know, I have a, a dragon. that's almost identical to the cover. It's actually called a griffin. Uh, a griffin is a statue in, from Thailand they used to put in front of their temples. And it's a, a lion, a snake, and a reindeer, of all things. I had to do research on this thing I bought 45 years ago. And it's six feet high, and it's all green and wood, and it's really old. So I just took pictures of the face and the body and the tail and the, the wings I kept saying it's a dragon, but why does it have wings on my statue? And why does it have snakes? <laughs> and the whole thing is carved with snake skins. So uh, I had to do the research as far as the Chinese and Japanese believed was uh, the cunning of a snake, the ferocity of a lion, and I don't know what the reindeer thing means. So that was interesting. But I took pictures of my statue that's, I don't know, 400 years old. And just sent all those pictures to Chris and said, run with it, boss. And he did it. Great job. Yeah. yeah the, the, job. The, the cloak, the, the, the quote rather, uh, that I liked of yours of late, you said, listen, this has been a long process, but I think we've got lightning in a bottle. Yeah, I still, I still believe that. You know, obviously, you know, we're having this interview and I'm sure every artist you talk to, they put a new record out and they say, this is our best record ever and it's great. And, you know, that's what you're supposed to say, right? The yeah, only thing yeah, I yeah. ever said that was on Shadow Life. I hated Shadow Life. 
You know, it's a terrible record in my opinion. There's a couple good songs on it. Not because I wasn't involved in that record. You know, the other three of them wrote that record and just sent it to me to write lyrics. But I didn't like the music. So that's why there's that trivia question that if you look up every single Dawkins album, it's got our logo, you know, but not on Shadow Life. I refused to put my Dawkins logo on that record because I don't didn't think it represented Dawkins. They just it's hand drawn like in a pen. So it says Dawkins because I own the copyrights to the logo, and that's also Dave Williams who drew that and came up with that. I mean, you'd, you'd be shocked that it took him, I'd say, about three months to come up with what he felt the D and the O and the K should look like as mm -hmm. far as stylistically, because that's what he did for a living. And he had a book with, you know, when you go on your Microsoft Word and you pick a font. Yeah, yeah. Man, there's maybe 50 of them. Well, he had a book that had like 2,000 of them. I mean, I mean, every font known to man. And his challenge to himself was, I got to come up with something that no one's ever done for your docking logo. And I said, well, good luck. And he did it. You know? Brilliant. Now, are you at all nervous? Coming up to the release date, you've put everything in that is physically possible into making this. Yes. And now it's it's obviously up to the to the fans and everybody else. So are you feeling a few nerves or is it just like, right, that's it, is that there? Do what you will with it. No, I am not nervous about it. Uh, you know, of course, there's so many factors involved. If you, you know, if a, if a band puts out an amazing record, but nobody knows about it, as in what we're doing right now, promotion, yeah, yeah. Uh, the world's changed. There are no more magazines. Everything's webzine or podcast. Uh, it, it would be a tragedy that if this album doesn't sell well, but, you know, if it doesn't, it doesn't. You know, it's not a money thing. We don't, we don't need the money, you know. Uh, everybody has other things when we're not touring to support their lifestyle, whatever it might may be. But I think it will be, if it doesn't, you know, blow out because there's no more radio either. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think it'll be something that people discover. I've got to mention the, the other big project and uh, which could be really huge and bring the music to whole new generations of fans. And this is the potential movie. Uh, Netflix approached you about the, right. the Docker movie. So whereabouts are we in the process with this? I haven't heard from uh, Netflix. They're doing it. Some other companies doing a documentary uh, about the strip. And I went, oh, there's been a lot of those. But I haven't really been involved with the movie you know, the plot is just a bunch of guys that are fanatics uh, for Dawkins, kind of like the movie, what was that, Bill and Ted's or one of those movies. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they were they're obsessed with me. I think it was Alice Cooper or something like that. And it's the same premise. They're following, following, trying to get backstage. They want to meet us. They want to hang. And that's what the movie's about. But it happens in 1989. So obviously right. we can't be in the movie. I'm too old. <laughs> I got a beard, you know? <laughs> so they had to send me pictures of the actors and say, try to pick the one that looks the closest to you, Don. And then Chris picked his character and John picked his. And, and I, I go, I can't do that. You know? So I let my girlfriend do it. I said, which one of these guys looks the closest to me in 89? You know, uh, as far as if, you know, if their hair is short or straight or, and they can put a wig on the actor, you know? So I found, I picked a person to play my part. I don't think he looks like me, <laughs> but that's the way it goes. You know, I couldn't. Did you want to, did you want to have a role involved as uh, in, in part producing this at all? Well, I was very rigid about this movie. I turned it down many times for Netflix. Um, Cause I said, I, I can only agree to this if I'm the executive producer. Not for the, because I, I just want to have some control when it comes toward the end. I don't want anything uh, negative in the movie or 
bad stuff. Like, you know, Motley did the movie Dirt. And, uh, you know, and they basically laid it all out there. You know, Nikki Six with a needle in his arm and Odin and all that. And I could have told a lot of those stories in this movie. And I'd asked them, you know, I prefer you don't. Let's keep it up, not dark. You know, I mean, so that was only my only request in this movie is, you know, yeah, you know, all the guys in Dawkins were all drug addicts. I mean, that's common knowledge. That's what broke the band up. You know, I didn't do drugs. They did. So there there was a, ro a, a wall between us. How did you? I mean, this is this is one of the big, big questions. How could you have gone through that era, been around the people that you were around, and be the only one in your band, that is, that wasn't drawn into that world of substance abuse? Yeah. The uh, how did you miss it? Well, you know, I think I tried Coke when I was probably 20, 21. <laughs> As everybody knows now, it's infamous that, you know, people go to the rainbow and they're chopping lines of cocaine on the tables. But um, I tried it, you know, I just, I just, I just didn't, I wasn't drawn to it, you know. I mean, I, I think I have an addictive personality, but I just wasn't drawn to cocaine or, you know, drinking a whole fifth of uh, Jack Daniels in four hours. I just wasn't. I was more of a, a wine guy or champagne. Wine and champagne, wasn't it? Yep, I like my champagne. <laughs> so, so if you you like presumably you like that that movie Sideways. Yeah, oh, the one yeah. about the wine. Yeah, I was mind. I mean, I was. Uh, it, I found it so fascinating that this guy makes the perfect wine. You know, and it's California. That was awesome. And that he, he got rid of it all because he thought it failed because it was clear. It wasn't red. And it turned out that it turned red in, you know, in a month or so. And, and he beat out the French, you know, because everybody thinks the French have the best wine. And, you know, you, you, saw, you saw the movie and then he won. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't remember the who the, or, the, the winemaker is, but uh, I just loved the movie. And, and here this poor guy had never made wine before and he quit his job and he grows it and he makes it and thought I failed miserably. So he was taking it to bars and just trying to unload it. I thought it was hilarious. And then all of a sudden he discovered that it, it he just, you know, wasn't ready yet. So that, have you got a favorite variety of wine, by the way? Yeah, that's, that sucks because all the ones I love are too, are very expensive. <laughs> you right, so you're a, so you're a bit of a Chateau Lafitte and Pomerol man. Yeah, Chateau Margaux, Chateau Lafitte. Oh. <laughs> but uh, oh, the California wines, I, I love Silver Oak. Uh, if it's, you know, at least 10 years uh, old. And it's actually, I would say, affordable, you know. And I used to like Cristal when it was cheap. Er, then Dom Perignon was the most expensive. But then yeah, yeah. all those rap artist videos, uh, they started showing Cristal all the time, you know, in their videos. And then the price went through the roof, you know, 200 bucks a bottle. I went, damn. So John and I were always, we have our little app and they send us stuff like, you know, if the wine's rated 99 or 101. And, and we're always looking for an amazing wine that costs 10 bucks. <laughs> we're, 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 we're trying to find that wine that we can go out and buy a case, you know, a 10 bucks a bottle that's on the equivalent of a Chateau Margot or a Chateau Lafitte, but, you know. Have you ever been tempted, by the way, because every every man and his dog these days has a banned wine, a banned uh, whiskey, yep. a banned tequila. Have you thought, have you thought about doing uh, dock and wine or vodka or, or bourbon? Yeah, actually, we... we uh when I was on tour with Warren, they were opening for us several years ago, and they told us they had their own wine coming out called Red, I think. And uh, I said, wow, that's pretty, you know, they're, they're entrepreneurial. And, and I just kind of let it go, and I was in, like, some store a year later, like Trader Joe's, and there was their wine. And I was like, how in the hell did they get their wine in a, such a huge chain? 
you know, uh, I was shocked. So I'm happy for them. And I've thought about it. I mean, they didn't grow it. I think they just kept doing blends till they found something they liked. But a lot of the guys in Warrant live uh, in California and in inland where all the where all the wine uh, fields are and the manufacturers. Yeah, yeah. So they just found, I think, oh, Temecula. I think a couple of them live in Temecula. And there's a bunch of wineries out there. So they just went out and approached one of them and said, we want to make our own blend and we're going to call it something to do with one of our songs. And I don't know how it's doing, but, you know, I tried it. Uh, you know, what's it? Uh, Jeff Tate, he did it. And I did buy one of his bottles and they're pretty expensive. It's called Insania, but it was really good. I, 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 I emailed him and said, tried your wine, love it, you know? Yeah. But it so ain't tell you. me now, is uh, 40 years since you were down in Redondo Beach at Total Access Studios yeah. fine tuning the album. Mm -hmm. uh, Live to Rock was born from We're Illegal, and then we had uh, Stick to Your Guns completely overhauled to become Paris is, is Burning. Right. Then you had uh, uh, Juan Crucier leaving the band, Jeff Pilson coming in. And that was the moment that it all really began with the with the band as we came to know it. So, forty years. Are you are you planning any special celebration for this? No. As far as playing with the original members, no. I'm just talking about. Um, I, I don't know a, a repackaged, re-released, luxury edition, something like that. Um. Actually, our. Warner Brothers, uh, who's now Rhino, just released. I just got the package last week. They just released a greatest hits remastered uh, doc and album on vinyl. So uh, I haven't heard it yet because I don't have a turntable that's working right now. The needle broke. And uh, I was shocked that the stores now that sell TVs and stuff, they're actually selling turntables now. I just yeah, yeah. it's a dead it's a dead media, you know, but apparently people like buying vinyl. Yes, they do. Now that um, the, the album, the other thing about that album is you, you recorded it for zero money. How, how did that happen? Yeah, we didn't have any. And, and, you know, the original version of breaking the chains that I cut in Germany, I actually revisited that, the the one that Michael Wagner and me did. And I actually like the original uh, Break in the Chains better than the remix, even though Michael did both of them. Uh, I just like the original version better. And maybe it was because we didn't have any money. And we, I mean, my first record deal was for $8,500. <laughs> that was it. And I went, uh, okay. So I did it. I mean, I, I didn't care. I was broke. Better than nothing. And, you know, we had this 21-day window Dieter gave us to cut it, you know, at his studio and uh, Dirk Studios. So we were under a lot of pressure and, and no time and no money. So maybe that had something to do with not nitpicking all the songs and not taking them apart. because We had the luxury of a million-dollar advance like some bands. I remember... uh you know, it came out in Germany, and it was called Don Dock, and that's like a big collector's item now. The original Break in the Chain is a picture of me on the cover, chained up, and it says Don Dockin, because I had no band. You know, uh, George and Jeff were just hired by me to come to Germany and just be my session cats. They weren't really in the band. But there's some beauty about that record. It's a bit raw. It's, it's aggressive. It's just because we had to hurry up, you know. And there was those days you were there. doing the, the gigging around uh, LA, you had Motley Crue opening for you at the at the Roxy. That was weird. Uh, yeah. You did a few shows with Van Halen. That was before they put their debut album out. That was the back end of the 70s. What do you remember uh, about being on a stage or in the vicinity of where they were before they made it big? I mean, did you look at them from the side, from the, side of the stage and you go, wow, well, they're going to make it? This guy is something else. Absolutely. Um, I remember the first time we played with them was in Redondo Beach. 
And uh, it was a huge club that nobody remembers. It held like a thousand people. It was called the Smokestack because it was next to a processing plant that had huge smokestacks. And the guy had come from Canada and built this really state-of-the-art club in Redondo. And, you know, I was always bugging him that I wanted to play there. And that was the first time we played with Van Halen. And I saw myself as a pretty competent guitar player then. You know, I was the singer and a guitar player and a lead guitar player. But I remember all, it's like people say, what do you remember? You know, do you remember the day you heard that Kennedy was shot or the, you know, the, the towers being, you know, cra planes crashing? You remember 9-11. But I remember that, that gig and I'd, I'd heard about Van Halen. I hadn't played with him yet. I hadn't seen him. They hadn't made a record yet. And I just remember that moment being was upstairs in the dressing room and I heard them start to play. And then I said to Juan, I think, I said, uh, I thought they only had one guitar player because to me it sounded like there was two guitar players. And I remember walking out on the balcony and looking down at them and seeing this flamboyant singer, flamboyant clothes, and I see Eddie doing that two hands on the neck thing. And I was awestruck. I was godsmacked. And I, I think that moment I mulled about it and I thought, I don't, it doesn't matter how much I practice, I will never be as good as Eddie Van Halen. <laughs> and, you know, I, he was a genius and I miss him. And I think at that moment I realized I should probably start concentrating on being a singer more because I, I, I can't compete with someone like that. He's a genius. He was a genius. And I remember that moment. And then, of course, we went on to play with them many times at the Whiskey and the Starwood and all these other places. But that that show, the first time I ever saw them, I was, first of all, I was blown away by Eddie. Second of all, I was blown away by David Lee Roth because he was so flamboyant and gregarious. And uh, you know how he is. Everybody knows how David yeah, is. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, he, he David's David. I always say, you know, he got, uh, when they got famous, how uh, he was. And I said, oh, he was like that before he got famous. You know, he was always kind of very, you know, outspoken. Did you have the same, uh, did you have the same feeling when you were working with uh, Motley Crue, when you had them opening for you? Did you have the a similar feeling that <laughs> this is, this is going to be another huge band? Not really. I remember we the first time we the only time we played with them. I think it's the only time was at the when we they were showcasing at the damn what's the name of the club right next to the Rainbow uh, the Roxy Roxy and uh, we kind of laughed because uh, and we were showcasing and all the labels were there and you know here our equipment is torn and tattered and the fabrics falling off the drums are like taped together our equipment was crap and when they rolled in with all this brand new equipment and drums and the, the clothes and flamboyant and the makeup and the hair i thought wow who you know how'd they afford this <laughs> you know they weren't signed and then i remember their ep i think it was called too fast for love or, uh i think it was like a four or five song ep they put out but i didn't really have an opinion about these guys are going to be big, you know, huge. The only band I've ever played with that I knew immediately, even though I saw them when they were playing clubs, when we did the stadium tour and Metallica was going on before us. And they were kind of the reason that maybe that Dawkins started going, falling apart because Metallic would go on stage every day and and to me it was like they played every show like it's going to be their last show and they don't care if they drop dead on stage you know they just were like over the top 100 percent energy you know they just were really mm. really in it you know they were popular in europe and that but they hadn't broken out because they hadn't done the black album and yeah for sure and now that they are the biggest band in the world and i said that and we had the same managers. And I kept telling my manager, Cliff Bernstein, I said, I know we may be more famous than them or we're making more money than them, but can they go on after us? <laughs> because they were killing me. They were killing us, you know? 
<laughs> and we'd already been on the road for a year. We'd already done a world tour, and we were pretty worn out. But it, it was frustrating. It's, I couldn't talk to the band. I said, guys, you know, look at look at Metallica, man. They're just they're just crushing it, you know. And I think we got too full of ourselves and too cocky because we'd had a couple of platinum records and done world tours with ACDC. And, but they got complacent, in my opinion. And again, you, it was drugs. What you did at the beginning, though, was, was very rare back in the 70s, early 80s. You went to Europe where you were seen on stage and there started to be a following there. Very, very few American bands did what what you did. You were also very aware of the new wave of, of British heavy metal. You were a big fan of Judas Priest as well. When you, Sad Wings of Destiny, I think, was the, the album that you picked up in 76. That was a moment. It threw, I mean, it blew my mind, you know. I, I Then I went back and realized that it put a record out before that called Rockerola, and it was, and to me, it was awful, you know, I mean, it, they hadn't found themselves yet, obviously, because Rockerola has nothing to do with the later Jewish priests. It was very, uh, just rock and roll. I didn't think the songs were that good. I wasn't crazy about it, but yeah, when I heard Sad Wings of Destiny, I, I, I was just blown away. And, uh, I remember I wore it out, you know, I had to buy the record like three times, <laughs> And I used to drag people to the house and say, you got to listen to this band. And the odd thing was they weren't famous in America. You know, they were just kind of coming up the ladder. So I was always trying to tell people, you got to listen to this record. It's amazing. And we'd have like, uh, you know, like we'd sit around my little apartment and just play records, you know. And uh, it was amazing. That record's still amazing. So tell me, when you look back at your catalog of work, over the last four or decades is uh, is dysfunctional still your favorite yes i think it really is until this new record dysfunctional i mean it took a long time to write um i think the gift was i built a recording studio by then after i made some money and i just couldn't understand why we're spending so much money on these recording studios and i said hell i could build my own studio for that and i did you know, it wasn't state of the art. It was just straightforward. All English equipment, uh, English console, English everything, EQs, compressors, old, old stuff. Yeah, yeah. That Michael Wagner went out and found these EQs and compressors that were broken, but he knew how to fix them. So he'd be in there with his soldering gun. We'd buy this stuff cheap. And I didn't know what was good or bad. And Michael said, this is a great EQ. This is a great compressor. I'm going to fix it. You know, so uh, my recording studio became, even though it was only 500 yards away from total access. And Brilliant. I, so, I, listen, you've achieved pretty much more than the majority of, of people in this in this industry over the course of your career. Is there something that you would still uh, like to accomplish, something you'd still like to do? Is there something that you would like to collaborate with? who you've never collaborated with before? That's, you know, that's an interesting question. I, I would like to write a song with somebody I respected, you know, as a songwriter. There's so many of them, and, it, and it's interesting. You just brought that up. I never thought of it that I've never collaborated, you know. <laughs> I didn't collaborate with my own man, band members. You know, the, the three of them were kind of like an hour away from Redondo Beach, so they all... Uh, wrote together uh jeff uh mick, while mick and george lived together and they had their little eight track and george, jeff would drive out there and i couldn't collaborate with them you know because it was too frenetic you know the coke and the drinking and the excess and sometimes i'd go out there and see what's going on and they probably hadn't slept in a few days so <laughs> it was you know it was hard for me to collaborate so that's why i never collaborate with my own members everything i've wrote i did by myself guitars bass you know vocals lyrics i wrote them alone so tell me what why is it do you think that people after all of these years people are so obsessed with your relationship with 
George. I mean, I look at interviews yeah. that you, you've done and you could have a great new album coming out, great new music, et cetera, et cetera. And literally the first thing that you get asked is, well, um, when are you going to get the original band back together? How's it? Is George playing on this? Is it, why yeah. are people so obsessed yeah. with this? I don't know. Every Everybody keeps saying that. And so I thought I threw him a bone on this last this US tour we just did with, you know, the Don Doc and George Lynch reunion. And he was just coming on stage and doing a couple songs at the end of the show. But, um, and here it is 40 years plus later. And that ran its course. And then George put Lynch Mob back together. So then Lynch Mob was actually opening. And then he'd come on stage with this still, because apparently people wanted to see him and I on stage together. But I I didn't like it. I didn't want to do it. I did it, but I'm not glad we did. I put the kibosh on that now. John's been in the band over 20 years. George yeah, was yeah. in the band eight years. <laughs> <laughs> and George has changed, you know. He, um, I think he's searching, you know. I don't know. I, I saw that he did six. He texted me, and uh, it's ironic that I live in New Mexico now, and so, and so does George. <laughs> he lived in New Mexico, so he's about an hour away. And I said, you know, if you're driving to the airport, because there's no airports where he lives, I said, you should, you should come by and, and come to the villa and see it. And he said, yeah, someday I will, I will. I'll stop by, you know, because I live right outside of Santa Fe. And, uh, but being on tour with him, even, you know, with Lynch Mom opening and playing a couple songs with this, uh, you know, I don't feel any magic at all. He just comes on and plays, you know. I think, yeah, yeah. And my opinion is, you know, I don't talk to George much on the road, really. Um. You know, he just shows up and John leaves the stage and he comes on and I don't even see him till he walks on stage and then he's gone, you know, but he, I think he's searching for something new, you know, as a guitar player. That's my opinion, because the way he yeah. plays now is very, uh, out of the box, you know, yeah. he doesn't play like he did in the eighties or nineties. It's totally different now what he's doing. But, um, George, so, you know, he does it maybe, I mean, I'm, I can't speak for him. I just think it's become a job for him. You know, I mean, six albums a year with five different singers, five different drummers, five different bass players, you know, yeah. and I'm like, who's in, I mean, he would come on tour with us. And I'm like, who's in the band today? I didn't even ask what their names were. Cause I figured they'd be gone by the next show. And they are most, you know, I mean, George, he has this revolving lineup of people that in Lynch Mob too, you know, and, 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 you know, he did the thing KXM with, uh, Doug Pinnock and, uh, Michael Sweet and, you know, he's done a lot of stuff, but I, that's not what I want to do. I am so happy having Chris and BJ and John because we have the thing that I always missed in Dawkins. And that yeah, camaraderie, yeah. camaraderie, friendship. We have a day off. We hang out together. We go to dinner. You know, we sit around and talk about music. And sometimes we have to drive for four or five hours between shows, rent a big SUV, and we just listen to music and talk. But, you know, I never had that relationship in the original doc. And we, we didn't even speak. And it was just sad. I would say the Aerosmith tour was the where we came closest to being, uh, you know, a band that was getting along and playing well. There's a bootleg video on YouTube, and it's docking live from Philadelphia. And that's the Aerosmith tour. And it's just, a, you know, the cameras were filming us. It's a really beautiful uh, piece, you know, a bootleg. And they ran a line to the console. So the sound quality is pretty good. And, you know, the camera works good. And, and okay, I yeah. watched it, and I went, man, we were really hitting our stride let's put it that way we're hitting our stride so lastly then the uh, the future the albums uh, the albums going to be coming out in the next couple of weeks yep do you think you know hand on heart this will be the last album that you do in terms of doc i mean i know you're working on the christmas album but do you think this will potentially be the last doc and album yes it, it will be 
it's funny you said right. that because we were so shocked. I mean, we were happy when we did Fugitive and put it up on the internet and it gets, you know, over a half a million views. I thought, wow, you know, there's a whole new generation of people that are getting turned on to Dawkins. And these days, everything's changed. You know, back in the day, the heyday, you know, I had a security guard and we didn't let people backstage unless they had a, a short miniskirt. <laughs> 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 you know, and that was true, you know. And uh, it's, it's, you know, I, I meet, we do, we do these meet and greets now, all the promoters want. Yeah, them. yeah. You know, it's this just became a standard and I always pick their brain and say, how old are you? Oh, I'm 23. I'm like, wow. And they're musicians. Or, and I said, I saw you in the front and you were singing all the lyrics and you weren't born when we did <laughs> our four biggest, my biggest records. I mean, how, how did it happen? And they always had the same response. You know, they say their parents were big fans. But, you know, you get married, you buy a house, you get a job, you get a life. You go into college, you know, the, the days of going to concerts is behind them. They have kids. And then when the kids turn 10, 11, 12, they, they just give them all their records and all their CDs. And they found us, you know. And I met a lot of kids, or not kids, you know, young adults that said we, didn't, we never heard of Dawkins until I was going through my mom and dad's collection. And I found Tooth and Nail or Unlock and Key and Dysfunctional or whatever. And they say, we really love your music. So we have this very eclectic fan base now. I just played three days ago in Massachusetts. We had about 7,000 people. And I could look out in the audience. I was singing and see a lot of young people at the front. And they're singing along. And I'd see 25-year-olds, 35-year-olds, 65-year-olds. I'm like, wow, what a what a mix of an audience, you know. Four <laughs> generations. I see older people, young people, and I'm like, so I don't know what's going on, you know, as far as is there a resurgence, you know, apparently. I mean, Motley Crue still sells out arenas and when they do tours and they're supposed to do one more. Aerosmith's on their farewell tour. Uh, Kiss has been on their farewell tour for 10 years. <laughs> I have to laugh about that, you know. I mean, uh, we, we did. I've never done those cruises we have here in America. You know, they have these rock. Yeah, the the, the, the hard rock cruises. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They didn't do ask you, me to do it forever. And I always said, I don't want to be stuck on a boat for a week. If you, if somebody did come along and wave a load of money at you and said, right, well, um, you know, th we know this is your, your, your last album. Um, we, we'd like to facilitate the last tour, uh, but we want the original band back. Uh, so here's the money. Uh, this is what we want. Would you do it? No, simple no. You know, seven years ago, we tried. And they wanted us to do a reunion tour. And uh, I talked to my band members that are current, and I said, we have this offer to go back to Japan where we're really big, you know. So they wanted to do Japan and a full-blown reunion U.S. tour. And I said to the guys when we met, well, We'll go to Japan, we'll do five shows, and we'll see how it goes. And then we'll talk about a reunion tour. And that tour did not go well. You know, I mean, we sold out every night, but it didn't go well. And, uh, and of all the people, I was the worst. I mean, I was singing terrible. Uh, I just didn't have any energy. I didn't feel it, you know, that magic. And we just did it. And afterwards, I said, no, mm -mm, no reunion tour. We don't have it anymore. That ship has sailed, you know. Jeff's been in, Pilsen's been in the foreigner for over 20 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And plus Mick, you know, was the big shocker to me because Mick kind of stayed with Doc and off and on through my entire career. So Mick was the longest running guy as a drummer. And then when he left the band, very suddenly, I mean, we were getting off a plane in Phoenix. And we're walking toward the baggage and we're all going, where's Mick? <laughs> and I ran back to the plane and he had just, it took him literally about five minutes to get out of his seat. And I said, what's, and he was limping and I grabbed his bag. Let me take it that. And 
And that's, I remember that that day he, he looked at me and he said, I need to talk to you. And he said, you know what? I can't do this anymore. You know, I'm leaving the group. I, I can't do it. And I understood, look, I've always said forever, because I was a drummer, he had the hardest job in the band. You know, as far as mm -hmm. physically, you know, your knees, your feet, your arms, your shoulders, torn rotator cuffs, uh, you know, and I'd always tell him, don't play so hard, Mick. I mean, you're a hard hitter. He was like a bottom, you know, but he goes, I can't, you know, he goes, I, I, I only know how to play drums one way or I can't keep my time. But he finally just said, I'm done. I'm worn out, you know, and that was yeah, it. Yeah. And I, I saw an interview about him three weeks ago. It was, he, he, you know, he shut down all his social media. He's off the internet. And he finally did an interview for something called, I can't remember. It was some magazine for the beach or something. But he said flat out, you know, uh, I'll, I'll, I don't want to ever pick up drumsticks again. You know, he has no desire. And he said, yeah. I like my life. I made my money. You know, we sold our catalog to Warner Brothers. So we made millions of dollars on that. And Mick goes, I'm done. You know, I just want to ride my Harley, live my life. And I'm happy in Phoenix, Arizona. And he said repeatedly, I don't want to see a drum set. You know, yeah. he sold them all, but you know, I, I get it. You know, he's worn out and he can't Neil Perch did the same thing in rush. You know, he said, I can't, if I can't play a hundred percent, then it's time to stop. Same thing. Physical. You tell you, you tear, you get arthritis. It's like a quarterback, right? The very short life expectancy yeah. as a career quarterbacks last maybe except for uh, the one guy that keeps, in his 40s, keeps changing teams, and he wins. Can't remember his name offhand. But, that, you know, Neil left and because he was worn out. So I understood when Mick left. And uh, that was, you know, a bummer because he had been with Dawkins from the beginning, the very beginning, almost. You know, I had a couple – other band members before that, but, and then uh, shockingly, he didn't, you know, he, like, I think got cancer or something passed away, but I got Mick, you know, that he just said, I'm done. You know, it was becoming to him painful. He was mm. in pain to play. Remember we played, yeah, yeah. this was supposed to do like a one and a half hour show, with like 15 songs. And we got to like the ninth show and, I turned around and I saw Mick stand up and throw his sticks down. He goes, I'm done. And he walked off the stage. <laughs> I'm done. I'm like, but we have six songs to go. He goes, no, I'm done. <laughs>